Welcome to the Unsafe Spaces podcast, where we dig beneath the surface and challenge conventional wisdom. I'm your host, Michael Johannes. Victor Hugo said that no army can stop an idea whose time has come. In this show, we explore ideas that can help you change how you see the world, make better decisions in life, and maybe get outside your comfort zone to work on the goals you always wanted to achieve. All right, welcome to episode two. In this episode, we have Tom Savage, an entrepreneur from the West Country who has recently caused a bit of a stir by asking one important question. Can I just start companies and not run them? We get really deep into that topic at the 39 minute mark, but before that, we discuss a bunch of other things such as the struggle between our idealistic self and the low life pleasure seeker inside of us. We talk about Tom's suggestion to achieve less and live more in the moment and why he tore up his bucket list at a TEDx talk wearing bathing shorts. So he's quite an interesting guy, to say the least, and I was very curious about his take on the founder, not CEO thing, because no one has ever positioned this idea so bluntly. You know, how about we have people who only do the founding and not the running of startups? So I hope you like it. Enjoy this episode. Okay, we're live. Tom, good to hear from you. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. A pleasure. Good morning to you. Good morning. Where are you in the world right now? I am in sunny Bristol in the west of the UK. Mm -hmm. Are you living in the woods? (laughs) Um, I'd quite like to. Now that the summer's here and solstice is almost upon us, it's a good time to be living in the woods. But now I'm, I'm being quite conventional and living in a flat at the moment. Yeah, so the reason I'm asking you about the woods is that It is a story that you mentioned in your TEDx talk, which is live and the link will be, of course, in the description. It was quite a good and and an interesting insight into your mind. Notably, you had a very interesting finale of it. It was quite an unexpected one and you got a huge applause from the audience. And I'd like to start with that. You took out a bucket list from a literal bucket and where it was quite a humongous bucket list it looked like it was several sheets of paper and you tore it up in front of the audience i found that very striking can you tell us more about that (laughs) sure so um so yeah i i was living in the woods um previous to doing my tedx Uh, i actually also was living in the woods as i raised my um series a round um so i was disappearing into Mayfair boardrooms uh, without telling these investors that actually I was going home to a tent at night, which was quite fun. But the the bucket list was really, um, the the topic of the TED was, is ambition killing us? And I, like many people, have all manner of ambitions and things I wanted to do in life. I was taught from an early age that we should strive and go for achievements and I felt like these achievements had been actually potentially, or seeking these achievements had potentially been doing more harm than good. So um, I guess the TED talk for me was, and uh, I'm also wearing an odd outfit, was um, symptomatic of my kind of existential feeling of both wanting to enjoy the present moment. Um, and I've studied a bit of Buddhism, and meditated a lot and thought about if you like, the present and awareness and consciousness and being in the moment versus the striving for the future, the always innovating, the always improving, the wanting to do better, which actually makes you very future-based. And I guess that my career and the way that I feel has often been a, um, you know, has, has mixed those two things. And sometimes that's been great and sometimes it's been quite hard in that, um, if you're constantly striving, then you're not necessarily enjoying the present moment and vice versa. So um, I tore up my bucket list as a way of saying, maybe I can be a bit more in the present and maybe some of these things on this bucket list will still happen if I focus more on doing what's right for me today rather than working 80 hour weeks uh, in order to get to some fictitious thing on the horizon. So that's that's really kind of what the TED was about. Mm-hmm. What kind of outfit were you wearing? Uh, I was wearing a suit on top and I was wearing a pair of board shorts on the bottom. Um, 
So if you want to see my stringy little legs <laughs> on stage, then you can go and have a look at the video. Yeah, and that is expressing the tension between doing what you love and striving for achievement, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, achievement can also be doing what you love, but I think that my own struggle between these two uh, extremes is also somewhat representative of our societal struggle. I think that there are a lot of people who are working extraordinarily hard and they're walking, working towards goals that we have been prescribed. And often the realization of these goals. So I've met entrepreneurs who've achieved the, the holy exit moment, which is when they sell their business for extraordinary amounts of money. And it often results in a moment of, of sadness and upset rather than extraordinary happiness. So the, the actual achievement of a, lot, of a lot of these goals can often not give the satisfaction that we're promised. And I kind of think that you, know, you and I both work in tech or, or have done and um, there's a lot of promises that are made um, and we work in the way that we work and sometimes I'm not sure what that's for because I don't know why, for example, technological progress, um, there's certainly been some amazing benefits in terms of the developing world, lifting people out of poverty, but also we've seen people's addiction to social media, we've seen the technological promise that we would not do as much work actually um, uh, the opposite has happened, and we end up um, looking at our screens eight, nine hours a day. Uh, and to me, that feels like we're kind of slightly um, directionless, even though we have all of these great ambitions. Mm. I have the feeling that we are gaining more and more freedom, and it's freedom is really difficult to manage and cultivate and yeah, manage yourself. I think social media, for example, is a great example you are completely free to use it or not. Nobody's forcing you to do it. Yet people are getting themselves into a loop of validation and seeking for approval and so on that then, then gets them into a state of addiction. It's similar to the obesity epidemic, isn't it? Where yeah. we now have so much food and so much abundance that it's really hard to manage your intake. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, most of us, uh, and I'll speak for myself here, have spent the, the, the majority of our lives pretty lost and unable to determine what's necessarily good for us. So we know that smoking is not good for us, and yet I did it for 10 years. We know that eating unhealthy foods is not good for us, and yet I regularly lapse. Uh, I know that drinking is not great for me, but I often find myself out on a Friday night. So, um, you know, in, in Buddhism, they talk about people being awake or asleep, and I feel like um, a lot of us are, um, you know, are not really thinking about the fundaments of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. And then, even when you're aware of those fundaments and aware of what, if you like, can do yourself good, it's often very hard to have the discipline uh, to be able to introduce those changes into one's life. So, but, you know, that's 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 normal. That's the human condition. That's um, that's where we are. But I think that increasing awareness of these looming problems and trying your best to free yourself from the, the shackles of these these ties um, is important and is worth looking at and you know social media is a new thing um, but I think it causes extraordinarily harm to uh, extraordinary amounts of harm to a lot of people and um, you know I, I don't know whether Facebook has actually done more harm than good in the world so far mm, and that's, that's a good quite question big, an interesting question yeah so the pernicious effect that social media has upon the mind and on, on happiness is by now undeniable. I'm a huge fan of, do you know this guy, Cal Newport? Uh, I've heard his name, but I don't know of him too well. He's a guy who's never been on social media and he advocates for a complete abandonment. And his point is very compelling in that he says we never look at the perceived downsides of things. Before we started recording, we talked about uh, trends and jumping on all kinds of different bandwagons. Many people, especially people in our world in tech and so on, they like to be on top of trends. Very often we just adopt trends without really considering what the downside is. But we are not good at asking the questions, well, what am I actually giving up? Yeah, absolutely. Right? And mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you mentioned food earlier, 
Um, it's often hard to see the connection between something you eat now and the impact it might have on your arteries. Um, Absolutely. Which, which is a, uh, if you like, a depth charge for the future. Mm. Um, you know, smoking doesn't normally harm people immediately. It's a much um, later effect. So I feel that you know, we're not very good at looking at the holistic benefits or negatives to the different behaviors we have. And, you know, I've, I've fought this myself, so I'm very lucky in that I've been exposed to a lot of literature. Um, I've had the privilege of being able to explore areas of interest. And yet still, every day, I, um, I'm i unable to maintain the kind of habits and disciplines that I guess I would like to. So there's this, there's this constant struggle between the actual self and the ideal self. Mm. Um, and that's one of the hard bits about life, but it's also one of the wonders of life as mm. well, and it's, it, it, it pushes us on to do great things. Yeah, but um, is, getting back to your topic of tearing up the bucket list, is that really the right answer? Isn't rather the management of your emotional states while you are still striving, while you're achieving, isn't that rather the, a kind of a, a benevolent detachment from the outcome, as in you strive, you achieve, but you are not completely hung up about the success of what you do. It's just... Yes, I, I think so. But I think also um, one of the things that, that I've realized is that the only moment that you can have an influence is the present moment mm -hmm. in time. So the past is gone and the future is yet to come. So your ability to, 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 to make any difference is only in the current moment in time. Uh, and therefore, by tearing up a bucket list, I'm somewhat symbolically suggesting that the items on the bucket list might still be achieved, but that if I focus on the present moment and doing the best in that present moment, which includes thinking about the future, but I can only do that in the present moment, and it includes making actions that may or may not be one of these depth charges, that the, the future will look after itself. Um, and... It's certainly been a challenge for me. Um, it's a challenge, if anybody's tried meditating, the ability to sit in the present moment without your thoughts running away with themselves is really, really hard. And it's, it's, it's amazing that something that feels like it should be quite simple, which is just sitting yourself, can be so difficult. And yet, doing that repetitively and training your mind to do that has extraordinary benefits, both um, physiological and, and medical um, and the more people have looked into it the more that it's been seen to be um, very very beneficial so that tearing up of the bucket list is not that I don't necessarily want to achieve some of the things on those bucket lists but it is really trying to remind myself that maybe those things will happen if I focus on the present um, and then there's that kind of oft you know it's about the journey not the destination line which I've been trying to um, bring it into my life uh, because I've had a lot of plans and I've had a lot of ambitions in my life and uh, things have uh, um, inevitably not gone according to those plans and yet has been very sweet along the way mm. and I think that if I was entirely focused on the end goal I might be frustrated where whereas and this is something I've really felt in the last six months since I stopped being a CEO that um, living in the moment is actually extraordinarily rewarding and um, and without that kind of future-based living I actually feel more satisfied and yet still I'm achieving a lot so it's kind of like taking out the 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 the, the constant forward looking uh, and trying to focus on the present. I think that's amazing that's a really good metaphor and I when I saw the TED talk I misunderstood that I had the feeling that you are tearing up the bucket list as a statement of a bit of a, like a cliche statement of oh let's let's all strive a little bit less let's not be on the hunt for money and worldly success but i misunderstood well, I, you there i do think we should strive a little bit less because okay. i think that if you do focus on the present um, there are a lot of wonderful moments that are here right now and i'm constantly amazed by the the, the kind of work ethic that certain people have to rush into a city um, and, you know, let's say, move numbers around in order to make more money out of money, um, and then are deep, deeply uh, unhappy with their lives. And it feels extraordinary. So in that case, I would say, yes, yeah, strive less. Mm -hmm. You know, go, okay. and, go and live in the woods because, um, as I realize, that's almost more rewarding than living in your uh, lovely house in Mayfair or Kensington. 
Um, and so, so yeah, I, I think it's a mixture of those things. It is driving less, but um, but uh, I, I, I do also think it's just a, a symbol of kind of being in the present moment. Let's quickly talk about your meditation practice. You mentioned that before that you have been doing it quite a lot. How good are you? <laughs> it's normally a question you shouldn't ask, but uh, I'm struggling with counting to 10. I wonder where you are on the... On the... Uh, so how good am I? Um, I'm generally not very good at discipline. Um, and meditation is one of those things that I know to be extraordinarily rewarding. And yet the discipline of maintaining a practice is really, really hard. Um, so I have in the past done a Vipassana meditation retreat, which is a, a 10-day silent retreat, which is very, very hard. Perhaps the hardest thing that I've ever done, and yet also one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Uh, I think that you learn in those 10 days um, things that you might not learn in years of therapy because things come up in the silence that you surround yourself with and the focus on the self. What has that, come up for you? That, What's that, sorry? What, what has come up for you? Um, a few things. I mean, the, the, the focus on time. So this, um, I mentioned earlier that the bucket list is partially about anticipating the future, about looking ahead. And I found the Vipassana extraordinarily painful because I was constantly thinking about when the session that I was in was about to end mm -hmm. or that I was only in day two and there were another eight days to go. Ten days in everyday life can go past quite quickly but in a vipassana it feels like forever and so that relationship with time and also that relationship with the present moment and recognizing that you can't pull the future into the present and you can't manipulate the past was something that really stood out for me in recognizing that the only agency i have is in is in this moment in time uh, that being said you can have realizations like that and then go back to your everyday life and not introduce much of that to to your everyday life. But I think these things start with insights. And then once you have insight and you are reminded of these insights regularly, you um, have something to come back to. So now my, I, I did a meditation retreat uh, two, three weeks ago for seven days. And it was a much lighter retreat than the Vipassana. Um, and I've been trying to do half an hour a day, let's say, um, but a recent wedding for a friend in Spain derailed that, and I've been traveling a lot. So I find it very hard to maintain mm. discipline. Do you use any? I, do you use any app? Uh, I do. I use something called Insight Timer, which is um, which is a, an app that's maybe used by. Uh, that there's something of a community on that app. Um, You know, I'm, I'm good friends with the founders of Calm, and I think that's an excellent app. The Headspace is great. Uh, Insight Timer is great. So I, I think it's worth just having a look to see what works for you. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other important thing about meditation, and I was talking to an amazing founder who has done an hour a day for the last three years, despite working extraordinarily hard. Um, he, he said that it took him six months of just dedicating to doing it every day without any desire for a result to get him over that hump of meditating so said another way i think that too many people go in and expect something very quickly mm. uh, and i don't think that that is what it's about also i think that you have to remember that um if you're very unfit which the non-meditator is in terms of their minds uh that starting something is a bit like starting exercise which is that if you go out and do a run uh when you haven't run before or you haven't run for a while um, it's going to be really painful so the other important thing to note is that um, it's not a you know there's no goal just sit with it and kind of let it go and let it do its thing and don't try and force it or push it or try and get lots out of it in the early stages um, and remember that this is you know this is thousands of years old and it's it's kind of interwoven into a lot of cultures and religions and all sorts of things so i think that the benefits are there but Even having recognized those benefits and gone quite deep myself, I find it really hard to do half an hour a day. So um, mm. I'm, uh, I do as I say, not as I do. It is an interesting dichotomy that on the one hand, you should not be striving to achieve. And I was asking the question, how good are you? It's slightly tongue in cheek because that's exactly the wrong question to ask when it comes to meditation because it's simply being in the moment, not trying to achieve anything. It's just be present. But at the same time, you do want to 
cultivate this ability to live in the moment. And that is something that you learn over time and you get better at it. So there is a bit of a tension between not achieving and then while you are doing the not achieving, you achieve. Yeah, absolutely. And, so, and there are also other benefits that um, translate into our everyday. So, you know, in the world of technology, our ability to focus um, is perhaps reduced due to notifications and the different pulls and pushes that we have. And what meditation is in another way is just a training of the mind to stay uh, on a singular train of thought or topic uh, for enough time to resolve it or to deal with it. So I think that one of the other kind of very simple benefits, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not religious, so when I talk about meditation, I'm talking about it from a, 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 a kind of non-theistic point of view, that it's really just a training for the mind to be able to deal with the pulls and pushes and strains and stresses of everyday life. Um, and everybody has those. So, you know, it's it's training. It's like physical fitness, but, uh, but for the mind to keep you on form. But as I say, I realize all of this stuff, but my ability to do it is... Um, it's less than my my desire to mm. do it, if that makes sense. Absolutely, and I like to, for myself, to use a starker language in order to to um, achieve the same goal. And I recently read a good article from a guy called Serge Faget, I, I, I hope I pronounce him correctly, where he said, if you aren't able to focus on a certain task for a couple of hours at a time, you're fucking stupid. So I just try to, whenever I feel distracted from something, I'm just saying, dude, you're being fucking stupid. Put the phone away. So that's, that's, that helps me. I think, um, I think I'm fucking stupid every day but, uh, <laughs> and most of the time because actually to maintain focus for two hours is extraordinarily hard. Of course. Um, and it, it probably took me till day seven of this intense Vipassana to, to have a half an hour period when I haven't, haven't disappeared off down a thousand uh, avenues of thought. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I think it's um, extraordinarily powerful. It is on, on vogue at the moment, but um, you know, I don't think that should either encourage people or discourage people from doing it. I mm. just think it's a, a wisdom that has been passed down from generation to generation that has somewhat got lost. And Absolutely. And some things... more applicable today than ever. Exactly. And some things are simply on vogue for a good reason as well. So Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Okay. Tom... Let's talk about your story. I was very um, intrigued by when you sent, we're part of a, a group of entrepreneurs and you have sent a very interesting article there uh, about the topic of being a founder, not a CEO. So we'll definitely get into that. But before that, could you give us a bit of a rundown of your story? You've been an entrepreneur all your life, which is something I deeply admire. I never felt brave enough to do it until I was in my 30s. So I would just love to know how you came to where you were, what inspired you in your teens to become an entrepreneur sure. and uh, what has your story been since? Yeah, I, I, I don't know why I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, I started the Entrepreneurial Society um, at both Edinburgh University and Oxford University. Um, and uh, at that point in time, it was not... Um, it was not seen as a, um, an interesting or important choice. Whereas I think those societies are now some of the most popular societies. And I think that uh, popular culture and the, the rise of the, the kind of cult entrepreneur has changed that. Um, so I kind of started, um, uh, I think if you'd asked me when I was young, I wanted to do everything. Uh, and being an entrepreneur was almost about having the freedom to be able to explore ideas and get things off the ground. So. I'm, I'm not a particularly creative person in terms of um, cooking amazing meals or, or doing crafts. Uh, I am a musician, so I've created in the past in that way, but I guess entrepreneurship for me was, was part of that creation. It's like you see a problem and you want to fix it, or you see something in the world that can be different. Now, I'm, I'm one of those people that's an organizer, that's a coraller of people. Amongst my friendship group, they're always like, well, Tom organizes the holidays for us all, and Tom does these bits. And I guess I see, and this is a bit about the future, uh, looking into the future, but I see something that I would like to do or I'd like to change, and then I don't see a great blockage between going out and changing it or doing it. Um, I mean, one important thing I would say about starting a business or being an entrepreneur is that 
that people have created this kind of big mental block about the fact that it's really difficult, and maybe we'll get onto that later, um, or that there is a moment in time when you walk into a company's house and you go and register this company name that you've been thinking of, and that is the uh, Damascene moment when you become an entrepreneur. And I, I just don't see it like that. Like I, I think that starting a business is asking somebody a question about a problem or is about um, about seeing something that you don't like and just giving somebody a call or something like that. And then if you keep at it, it can often escalate into a business or you decide that it's it's not right. But but um, going off track a bit, back to my own journey. So at Edinburgh, I started the Entrepreneurial Society. Um, I met a great friend who was running... Um, coral reef expeditions in the summer and I thought that that sounded like a rather good way of spending our summer holidays and, and joined forces with him and we ran a, a trip in the summer holidays of our uh, third year and then went on to do it again in the fourth year and I um, had said to him look I think rather than just raising all this money and creating a marine research station out somewhere in the tropics let's try and turn this into something which is sustainable something which um, which we're not uh, basically going for six weeks and coming home again. And so together with him, we started uh, a marine conservation organization called Blue Ventures, um, and that was uh, fresh out of Edinburgh. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's um, been extraordinary in that um, you know, now there are hundreds of staff in, in many countries across the world, and, um, uh, and it's achieving uh, fabulous things. Amazing. Um, so that was, that was my first foray, and the second was um, taking a break from that and going and, and helping start something called Make Your Mark with a Tenner, which is where we gave 10,000 school kids £10 and asked them to be as entrepreneurial as possible with that £10. And inevitably, the £10 was turned into huge amounts more money, and that if you had put that £10 in a bank, you might have made £10 and 1p over the same period, whereas... Uh, these amazingly creative kids were coming back with hundreds of pounds in projects that they'd created. Um, I then went on to start an environmental recruitment business called Bright Green Talent. Uh, so that was placing people in jobs that did good, so sustainability jobs, green jobs, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that was quite a wild ride in that we started and, and went from north to 14 staff and a million turnover in a year. I opened an office in San Francisco in about month nine from London, um, and then the financial crisis came along and um, environmental recruitment went from being one of the hottest things to um, to one of the hardest things to do. So that was a bit of a, a lesson in terms of um, doing everything right from a business perspective, but um, uh, having been, been kind of sideswept by the market. Uh, I then took a year off and I went to Kenya where I, um, I spent a year and built a house, which was a kind of crazy dream project that I'd always wanted to do. I'd seen Swiss Family Robinson as a, as a youngster and I thought that that looked cool and fun uh, and had an amazing year there. And then I came back and, um, and started working on a recruitment idea which slowly morphed into recognizing that people search was uh, a problem that people faced a lot and yet there was no Google for people. Um, so if you wanted to find a doctor in your hometown or if you wanted to find someone to teach you or a therapist or even an employee, uh, maybe LinkedIn was your best option. And so we set about trying to solve people search and I used to call it Hoogle. Um, <laughs> and that's what I've been doing for the last five years and had many twists and turns along the way. Uh, I should just say and finish that, um, that I think that the, the, the common thread throughout my career, if you like, has been uh, a couple of things. One is entrepreneurship and trying to get things started. And then the second has been, and I think I got a bit lost with um, Huli on this, is using business as a tool for good. So my, my kind of ultimate ambition, even though I've obviously torn up my bucket list, uh, but let's just say that, that there are ambitions still there, inevitably. My ultimate ambition is to create a company that the more profit it makes, the more good it does. And I think there are a couple of good examples of that. So the one that people often use is the clothing company Patagonia. 
um, and then there are other social enterprises. But I'm still frustrated by and think there is a huge opportunity for a company that could become the biggest company in the world that um, the more profit it makes, the more holistic good it does. Um, and um, I, I don't know if that's something that I want to create, but I'd love to be a part of building businesses that at least um, work in that direction. So, uh, yeah, that's me. So what do you think of the topic of making a lot of money in the normal world and then putting the money to good use, a la Bill Gates, Warren Buffett? Um, so I think Warren Buffett's extraordinary. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think he's extraordinary is not just the, um, the work that he's done to build this extraordinary business, but also the lifestyle that he lives alongside it. So he famously still drives his 1970s Volvo around, lives in the same house that he's lived in for years. Uh, I think he, um, he has a private jet, but um, that's the, the only thing that he um, has kind of slipped into of the billionaire lifestyle. Um, <laughs> apparently his kids, when they were growing up, um, were asked what their dad did, and they said that he was a security man because he had told them that he was in securities. <laughs> and so they thought he was somebody that dealt with security. Um, I don't know if that's an urban myth, but um, what I love about Warren Buffett is the fact that, that, that um, those riches, if you like, hasn't resulted in him buying yachts and um, places in the south of France and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think that's laudable. I also think it's amazing that he's given most of his wealth away to somebody else's foundation. So there's a degree of humility there that it's not the Warren Buffett Foundation and creating that legacy under one's own name, which um, instead he's just given it to somebody else who he thinks will do a better job of distributing it. And I think that's pretty amazing. That being said, there are investments that he's made in companies that um, people might uh, suggest are less than good um, and again I think that that is maybe representative of the old order of growing a business and then giving lots of money away and I wonder whether or not there is um, there is a new potential for a person or people or entrepreneurs or business people who actually can create that symbiosis between doing good and making profit I think you know As I say, Patagonia is an example where they look after their staff, uh, they try and produce things in an environmentally friendly way, um, they try and make clothes that you don't have to buy often, uh, that will replace them for you, but also they have extraordinary um, environmental programs and a lot of the money for the company goes into doing good on the far side. And to me, actually, from a business perspective, that just makes total sense because I want to buy Patagonia clothes because I know all of those things, so they probably make more money and there's this wonderful virtuous circle. And I, I'm amazed that more companies don't do that. I don't understand the world in which we live where, um, where companies are there to make money and then there's this side effect that they do good somewhere else or mm. that somebody who's made a big exit will then go on to do something good. I think that a company will motivate its employees, motivate its customers, motivate its management if those people feel like they are able to do good, because I do think that we humans have a desire to do good in the world. Um, and I don't think there are enough examples of companies that, 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 that do the two of those. The fact that Patagonia, which is relatively quite a small company, um, and it's in clothing, um, is the best example, I think is a great shame. That's no, um, that's no skin off the, the founder of Patagonia's nose. It's more a commentary on the fact that i'm just amazed that more companies haven't taken that lead mm. well i can imagine patagonia being quite a controversial example because i've read a little bit about them and they do they engage in a lot of activism right where i think they're very much going against some like congress legislation i think there was some something about some nature reserves that the Congress in the US was changing their policy on and they were very vocal about that and they kind of get into politics. So I can imagine how that, of course, polarizes the audience and then it means that half of the country will probably say, well, this is like a lefty brand and I'm not going to buy from them. So I think if you, if you take a strong stance, then probably you have to accept that you may alienate a couple of people, don't you think? Yeah, but, but business is all about taking a strong stance. Um, 
you know, you don't, you, you can't boil the ocean and do uh, everything for everyone. Uh, mm. And I, I respect that. I think that our world is one where strong stances are needed. Um, and, um, and, you know, these challenges are good. Mm. Uh, and I think that you need to have the extremes in order to draw more people over in that direction. Um, so yes, I, I'm sure there are elements of their strategy and, and their PR and the campaigns that they've run that I don't agree with, um, but I, I laud their uh, being willing to do it. Mm. No, absolutely. Taking a stance is great. I think it's it answers the question why it's not bigger, why these kind of movements are not the billion dollar companies that they should be is probably because they where, where a more neutral company may achieve bigger growth they would do it at the expense of not having taken a stance. Right? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you, Mark Zuckerberg has taken certain stances on privacy, which I personally disagree with, he's also taken certain stances on user addiction and um, acquiring users and growth hacking and so on that I also don't agree with. Mm. And those are quite extreme stances yeah. um, that have resulted in, in making huge fortune. So, um, you know... I don't think there are many companies in the in the FTSE 100 or the you know the top American companies that haven't taken extreme haven't taken extreme stances somewhere. Mm. Let's go back to your story. I still find it very fascinating that somebody, when they are just in university, that you already know that you want to be an entrepreneur and start your own things. When I was at university, I had the feeling I don't know anything about the world. Do you think is there anything where in your childhood and your teens? you were encouraged by your family or by friends and so on that these that nothing is impossible um i, I was very lucky in that i went to um private school and i think that one of the things that private school teaches you is confidence um uh i also my my dad has had a bit of a dream career in that he's a professional singer but he also runs a business that is a travel business for musicians and his passions are travel and music so um, I was able to see somebody that did really what they loved and what they wanted to do from an early age um, I just mentioned the privilege of going to private school I went away to boarding school aged I think eight or nine and I think that that is currently shrouded in this idea of privilege but I actually think it's extraordinarily harmful for a child to go away that early and it creates a lot of problems so I think that that early if you like captivity that I felt resulted in my fetish for freedom later in life um, and I think that um, it's a whole different topic maybe even a two-hour podcast but um, I think that boarding school is um is really um, not a good thing and yet it's still seen in our society as being very English and something that people should aspire to mm. um, so I think a combination of those things you know we are we as humans don't have a control experiment so I have no idea what would have happened if I had not gone away to school and and those other things uh, I'm sure I would have had a load of problems and, and, and done things elsewhere but that was my Uh, that was the cocktail that made uh, me who, who I was. And so I, I think I had a pretty unhappy schooling and then along came university and I met my, my tribe, my crew there um, and had a wonderful time. And, um, and that was really the point at which I started to, um, to kind of think about what I want to do. I guess for some people, university and, and your education is, is quite nice because it's uh, a regiment that you can fall into and you can do well at. Um, despite having got into some quite good unis, I, I never felt like I was A, academic, or B, very good at it. And I almost felt like the, the moment my life started was the exciting moment when I, I finished the conveyor belt of education and was suddenly faced with the wide blank canvas that is the rest of life. That's not to say that the transition was easy or I felt like I did a particularly good job of it, but I remember feeling existentially like, okay, it begins now. Um, as in when I was at university, I didn't really work very hard because I felt like I was just on the conveyor belt. Whereas when I finished, I thought, right, you know, I am, uh, I am now left to my own devices and I need to, um, create my own weather so Did you... yeah that's how I, I came to came to kind of starting something but I just had this urge to kind of get things going and um, create projects and that may well be 
um, something that, that was inherited rather than learned. I don't know. You, in April, I believe, you wrote and published this blog post about being a founder, not a CEO. And it had a huge resonance. I think it was one of the longest threads that, uh, that ensued this year where people very much chimed in with their own experience and said, I'm, I'm, I feel similarly. So can you, can you take us through the genesis of this, of, of this crystallizing in your mind? Yeah, so I mean, I start the article with um, uh, a quip, which is that um, Malcolm Gladwell talks about 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. And I think that the 17 years, which is about 178,000 hours of being a CEO, um, was the time it took me to realize that I wasn't good at something. Um, and and I, I don't know why I didn't realize it earlier. I'm glad that I have realized it. But it's this... There is a expectation within the entrepreneurial community that if you start something, that you are then the person that runs it until the moment that it either succeeds or, or fails or you get chucked out. And, um, and even so far as to, uh, if, if you look at the, the investment legal documents, so if you're lucky enough to get investment from an angel investor or a venture capitalist, those legal documents will often prevent you from starting anything else. And it, it was only through going through this kind of process of thinking myself, I realized how weird that was, which is I, I call myself an entrepreneur. I am a founder of things. That's what I love to do. I wake up in the middle of the night and write things down on the notepad by my bed because I'm excited about starting things. And yet the moment that you start a business and raise money, you are then locked into that business. And that is that suddenly struck me as weird. As I say, it took me 17 years to, to realize that. But you know, what I love doing is creating new things, potentially at velocity and potentially in parallel. And yet I wasn't allowed to do that. I had a five, six year period where I was singularly focused on an outcome. Now, there's huge amounts of benefits from being singularly focused, and that is the right thing for many, many people, and businesses are created by dedication and focus. But for me, it created, I think, a psychological entrapment where um, it was triggering fight or flight in me, which was that I didn't feel free. So entrepreneurship is, is um, very often hailed as being a way to run your own life, you know, to, to create the things that you want to see in the world. There's, there's lots of essences of freedom that get, um, that get talked about when you talk about entrepreneurs, you know, the lucky ones who can run their own schedules and, you know, and travel where they want to and, you know, seek out the clients and make the world in the manner which they would like to see it. And yet, the moment you start a company and you raise investment and you have customers and you have staff, you're less free than I would say most employees are because uh, of the nature of things. Um, so I think that I got um, swept up in the expectation of starting things and then being forced to run them and try and make them work. I think that the story that's told about entrepreneurship is one of stubbornness and um, dedication at all costs. And I think that that can mask a lot of the um, a lot of the problems that are actually um, deeper problems. So uh, certainly for some people, I think that that is the right way to go. But for me, that uh, narrative created, if you like, a bit of a prison for me, which meant that I was not doing the things that I love and am best at. I found that over the 17-year period where I've started the, the few things that I've mentioned and, and tried a couple of others, that there has been maybe 5% being a founder and 95% being a CEO. And the skill sets that I have and the passions that I have do not suit being a CEO. So there is a, there is a disconnect. There's loads of people who start a business and they're amazing at that early bit and they see the world and they have skills that enable that creative process. And then they find themselves in the running process, which requires a totally different set of skills. And the article that I wrote was really a, what if we split those two things out? And maybe some people, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Larry Pages of this world, can do both. Uh, what amazing people. But um, maybe there are people who are great at the beginning, and maybe there are people that are great at the, 
the middle, and maybe there are people that are great at the end, and they might be different people. Um, and w what if we were able to try and pursue the pieces that we were best at? Uh, and I don't think the entrepreneurial community at the moment supports that, um, and I don't think that that's um, surprisingly a, a narrative that is often talked about, so I wanted to kind of air that. And having aired it, what was extraordinary is the number of other founders who told me, whether in confidence or publicly, that they had felt similarly completely trapped. Uh, I think that there have been maybe a half dozen people that have since quit their businesses, hopefully not <laughs> as a result of my pushing them, but that they had realized the same thing. And maybe a fair few dozen others that have approached me and said, wow, I feel the same way, um, you know, I'd love to talk about it more. Is there, um, you know, is there something we can do about this? So I'm still in the very early stages of exploring what that means for me. Uh, I wish I'd come to this realization earlier in my career, but also maybe it's been great that I've done the things that I've done. You know, again, back to the controlled experiment of life, but I think I've learned a huge amount getting to this stage. So, so yeah, that's my, my belief that I personally am really good at the galvanizing, the, the pushing the snowball off the top of the hill so that it gets its first momentum, but I'm not the person to, to uh, run something or manage something or keep it going, at least not um, singularly and at least not full time. Where is the transition point for you when you say 5% of your time was being a founder, 95% CEO? When does one move from being a founder to a CEO? Um, it really depends on the business and it depends on the person. Um, if you start Google and if it goes off like a rocket ship, then maybe actually Larry has been somewhat of a founder all the way along because he's creating new things all the time from within because his vehicle is so fast and uh, making so much money that that is possible. Um, so it, it, it really depends on the circumstance. For me personally, and you know, I can't comment on other people in the way that they feel, but um, I love the seeing a problem in the world, going out and figuring out how to get it started. So that very early piece of momentum, the zero to one. Um, but I don't think I want to be hiring staff and managing day to day. Um, I think that every business needs some people who are solely focused on that and, and solely dedicated. Um, that psychological profile doesn't fit me, but it does other people. So in my case, I think I'm the person who, you know, it might even be somebody who finds a team and some money and an idea and puts them together, um, or does the first three months of an idea. Um, and so I really am a very much a, a the founding part of it. Whereas there are other people who are good for the first year or two years or three years, but then when a team gets to 20 or 30 or 40 people, that's when they no longer are in their sweet spot. Yeah. Um, so I think it's about discovering yourself enough to know where you sit and where your skill set is and, and also what you love, um, what you draw energy and passion from, and then positioning yourself to a best advantage. The really interesting thing for me is having written that article and part of it was a, uh, an attempt to try and find other people who felt the same way and were examples of living this life. So I would love to start multiple businesses at the same time uh, and run them in parallel um, and find people to, 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 to be the kind of the CEOs of them that I've found very, very few people who've done that um, well. So an example, and I'm afraid it's, I think it's a bad example, is Richard Branson, who's obviously created a number of things. He's used the vehicle of a brand, and I think he had some early successes, which meant that he had the capital. Um, the same is probably true in terms of profile of Stelios. Uh, but there are other... That there aren't many other people who've, who've created lots of things. Most people do things in series and not in parallel. And I'm really interested in exploring whether or not there is actually, at the moment, the government and the world is, is, is trying to encourage entrepreneurship. And if that's the case, I know loads of people who'd like to be working in a startup or running a startup or have their own business, but don't know how to get it started. So what if I was able to create 10 a year and hand them to these people who find the very first bit really hard, 
but find the subsequent bit very easy. Mm. Um, and and I haven't found a good pattern, and I am doing this. That's what I'm working on this year um, in a number of different guises, but it's it's still an experimental process, and I've still yet to find um, you know a dozen people that I can call up and say, hey, you've done this load. Uh, how does it work? What should I do best? Would you say that product market fit is a good approximate marker for you where you say, okay, we found what the market wants and now I'm going to hand over to an operational team? Or would you say you would prefer to even quit before that, where you just set up a few things, put the spark of inspiration into the team and see how they get on? Sure. So, I mean, product market fit for, for people who don't know is the, the moment when um, the market starts drawing the product from the company and it feels like you've got significant demand for the thing that you've produced. Um, that can happen at very, very different stages. So with Huli, because we were going after such a big ambition, which was to, to, to solve people search, um, we never got to product market fit. And I still don't know whether that was my own failing uh, or whether it was that we didn't get certain things right or that it was too hard or that it was impossible. Um, and yet I've just started a company, Brilliant Ethiopia, which is a travel company pe taking people to Ethiopia um, with a view to expanding into Africa, which is, I've partnered with a friend of mine who already runs a travel company that takes people to Patagonia. And within the first week we had product market fit and people booking and so on and so forth. So, um, because it happens at very different times for different types of business, I don't think that that necessarily can be used as the moment. But mm -hmm. certainly it's a lot easier if a company is making revenue and doing very well and growing fast to hand over than it is to hand over something that's still um, embryonic and still uh, more of a vision than it is a, a, a reality. Mm. You mentioned that many founders were very supportive and many voiced similar opinions. You also said that some of them mentioned it to you in private. Did you feel that there is a certain level of taboo around this topic? Are people scared to come out, so to speak, as founders, not CEOs? Have you received any criticism? Uh, yeah, I've received criticism. And yes, there are founders who, um, who definitely can't um, talk about it. The reason is that as I say, there is this narrative, which is that an entrepreneur has to go through the eye of the needle in terms of working hard to produce the company at the end. It's kind of the hero's journey. The narrative is that you start something and it's really, really, really hard for the first few years. And then there are little chicks of light and then it gets, there's a load more challenges. And then eventually you get to this magical point where it all starts to work and the flywheel turns. But it's only the most dedicated person and you have to be extraordinarily stubborn and, and go through that pain barrier to to get to the point where a company works. And I think therefore lots of people wander in and feel this pain. And another whole topic of conversation is founder mental health and entrepreneur mental health. And the, I think there are many, many people who are really struggling. Um, there's some crazy stat, which is a third of founders are suffering severe mental health issues. And I think that's partially because it is just hard, uh, but it's also partially that the narrative is such that um, everybody is forced into this somewhat uh, cookie cutter approach of, you know, you have to go through that um, hard period. So the people who came to me in, in private, often they'll be running companies with many, many um, stakeholders, so investors, uh, employees, customers. If they start to say that they're not really having a great time, they're not going to raise money again, uh, or at least they're going to really struggle. Um, I don't think a board wants to hear that the founder is ha having second thoughts or got cold feet because the narrative is such that that person has to be singularly dedicated to the cause and willing to, to do what they need to do at all costs. And so I think that's a bit dangerous. I think it creates these um, almost sociopath um, qualities which I think, um, yeah, which I, I don't think necessarily are constructive. Sometimes they'll pull people through, but sometimes they'll create, as I say, mental health issues and people doing the wrong things for the, in inverted commas, right reasons. Uh, and I think that's a real problem in the entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurial world at the moment. 
I think it also takes quite a strong level of bravery to come out in this way, because as you've seen on the list of founders that where you posted this idea, quite a few did come out and I was very appreciative because many of them are in companies and who that have received external investment. So I, it must be very difficult to to out yourself in this way. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I mean, I wish I had outed myself earlier. Um, and um, I was very lucky in that my investors were uh, fan, you know, fantastic investors. So Rory Sterling, who was at BGF, um, Layla at Kindred, um, I felt like I had a board that was um, very founder friendly um, and very enlightened, but I know that that is not the case with many people. So even despite that, and a co-founder who was also very supportive, it was very hard for me to do, and it probably took me two years to say it. Um, but if you don't have that support structure around you, and you're not lucky enough to have investors that think that way, then it's probably impossible to do. Um, so, so what was yeah. their what was their reaction? Uh, because they are, of course, they need to protect their investment. They are you are the leader. You are essentially the person who they invested in. How specifically did they react? What was so great about their reaction? Well, I think they were certainly disappointed because um, I was essentially admitting defeat in some way, whether it be personal or business defeat, and that's not what they signed up to. Um, so yeah, I felt disappointment. Um, Maybe other people on the board were even more disappointed and kind of said, well, you should just buck up. You know, you're giving up when you actually need to double down. Um, so I did get some resistance from others. That being said, you know, I went for a long walk in Hyde Park with Rory when I told him. And, and you know, he was amazing in that he just took me aside and said, Tom, you know, when we invest in people, we know that a lot of these things aren't going to work. Um, and... Um, you know, I don't think it's a failure of you to have got to this stage. Um, so he was very sanguine about that whole process. But anybody who knows Rory knows that he's the kind of white knight of venture capital in the in, in Europe and, and has been thinking about these things for a long time. Uh, and so, you know, I was just lucky that the news was being delivered to him and not some of the other characters that I know in the industry who probably um, would have gone very red faced and there would have been a lot of shouting. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, um, as I say, it was really hard to do despite having um, probably the easiest person to do it with. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know whether or not I should have kept doubling down on that business and that we would have suddenly come round the corner. There are famous stories of companies that are almost at death's door um, that then produce amazing, um, amazing phoenixes. You know, Twitter, Slack, Flickr. Um, two of those were founded by the same person who had um, last-minute salvations. So I think that you <laughs> running a business is really hard. I guess the thing that um, I would try and recognize in myself and in the companies that I was working in, is that if you're pushing things uphill for too long, something's not working. And most companies have a moment where things start to fit together and it feels like you are helping something go downhill rather than just forcing something uphill. Um, that might even be after year three or four. Um, for us, five years in, we'd never hit that moment, and therefore the... I felt like we were not going to get to a downhill moment, if mm. that makes sense. Mm. And yet, brilliant Ethiopia, which I've just started, has touch wood been um, pretty much downhill so far. I foresee there being significant uphill stretches, but I know of entrepreneurs who've started something and it just feels right and it feels like it catches. Uh, and I know of others who've never really had that moment where it's really started to come together. Mm. And I think that you've got to be mindful of, of the difference between stubbornness and stupidity um, and resilience and, um, and just, uh, you know, over, overdoing something. The way uh, you I don't use... know where that moment is. I think yeah. it's different for everybody. The way you use the metaphors downhill and uphill is uh, downhill meaning that it's like smooth sailing, you mean? I mean that, you know, gravity is on your side. One yes, way on okay, the other. understood. So what is your role in Huli now? So Huli has, um, uh, Huli is now being run by my co-founder, 
um, I am, I guess, a now the equivalent of a board member or an investor in that I still have vested shares in it. Um, and uh, we've done a pivot, which is instead of people search, we're company search. So the way I like to describe it is we're like the Bloomberg for all the other businesses. So we index huge amounts of the web, uh, the public web. And then we're able to see patterns to determine what certain companies are doing. So, and that can be used for working out when people are about to recruit or when somebody's just raised money or when somebody is about to move offices. Um, and so it's, a, yeah, it's a powerful way of, of getting um, a reading on what lots of different companies are doing. So useful for people who are trying to track companies at high scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and my co-founder is running that and, um, uh, and I think it's starting to, to see chinks of light, but um, hmm. as I say, I'm not involved day to day anymore. Yeah. When you were talking about this concept of being a founder, not a CEO, and how your own discovery of yourself went, I was thinking maybe the, a good approach is if you feel that you are that kind of type, i.e. a founder, not a CEO, that you choose companies that are much more likely to hit the, as you call it, downhill path much faster and this is already inherent in the choice of the business model so yeah. if you bear with me something like huli which is a people search engine which is a huge undertaking as you said you've been working at it for five years without ever hitting the inflection point where gravity was on your side this is of course in hindsight you always know better but whenever you feel like you are about to take on this big challenge Maybe knowing that you're more of a founder type than a CEO type, this would be the wrong business for you. Rather than, and when in contrast to this, a um, travel company for Ethiopia, well, that is something that is much more traditional business model and much more likely to work out and to have at least some form of success. It may not be a tens or hundred million pound business, but it it's very likely to work out if you have smart people working at it. So is the choice of a business, choice of a pursuit, does that help in satisfying the founder, not a CEO in you? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a great point. And I think I probably am uh, choosing options that have a higher probability of success, having come off the back of something which was a moonshot. Um, so there's part of it which is reactive to the experience I've just been through. That being said, you, Patagonia was founded by a man who was just building um, uh, bits of climbing equipment for himself so that he could go and spend six months a year what he called dirt bagging, which is essentially sleeping rough and climbing and scaling the peaks of California and beyond. And it's now a multi-billion dollar business. So I think that we also need to remember that these, in inverted commas, small businesses if they stand the test of time, can often grow into really interesting businesses later. So yeah. um, just because you start with a business that in our case is a re replica of an existing business that um, has been run by my co-founder, therefore we're very lucky in that I know a lot of the things that we need to do next and we're not making it up as we go along. Uh, that has probably a higher probability of success, but um, that's not to say that if we don't expand to 25 countries across sub-Saharan Africa over the next 20 years. It could be uh, a very large business indeed, um, if it works. Exactly, so, and you probably can satisfy your founder, not a CEO itch, by just by adding new countries, by expanding. That probably still is very much in line with this mindset, correct? It's only the, the managing of the existing, that is not the fun bit. But the always expanding into the new country, that is fun. That still yeah, is being a founder, yeah. right? And I, I also want to flag up that um, that my experience is singular to me and that if Hooli had worked extraordinarily well, then maybe I'd still be in the CEO seat and, and be running it. So who knows how connected the, the, the dislike of management is, is as a result of something not working to working. But hmm. what I know about my psychological profile is that, that I don't draw strength and joy from, as I say, the, the HR issues that, that inevitably occur when a business gets to a certain size. I'm probably not very structured in my thinking. I'm not very good at process and operations. Um, you know, those are the things that I don't draw a lot of energy and joy from. 
whereas I love the creative process, I love the, the, the shaping of new things, which obviously can happen within a business if it's growing fast, or can happen in multiple businesses. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm, what I'm really fascinated by is that um, this, this idea that, that, you know, what if you could do five companies in a year and play an active role? So the, 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 the African travel company, I'd like to still be involved in, in we, we've just written our values and we're, we're talking about a 25 year um, timeline. I'd like to be involved then. So it's not giving birth to and then just handing it over uh, and never touching again. But uh, uh, there's a different involvement, which is the, the piece that I'm, I think that I'm best at, which is that I'm a roving minister without portfolio for things that need to be created rather than somebody that is there to help till things um, or, 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 or manage things. And I don't want for a second to be disparaging about the, the power of being a good run or manager if anything i'm in awe of those people who are able to to do that role but one of the comments that came back from many people as a result of the article written was that the, 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 there was a divided response which is that a lot of people came back and said i love the running bit and i'm not a founder and other people who said i love the founding bit but i'm not a runner and so you know we use different terms so we use founder and we use entrepreneur and we use ceo and I'm interested in carving those up a bit. So a lot of people who are entrepreneurs started a business once and then have grown it into a big thing. You know, how much of that was actually entrepreneurial as in starting and how much of it was running? It could be 1%, 99%, and yet they're still hailed as entrepreneurs. Founders are the people who you know, are there at the start and CEOs run. Um, I, I think it's dangerous to get into language because different people have different understandings. But um, what, what I'm thinking is, what if there was a group of people who were great for the beginning process and helping getting new things either within a company started or a new company started? And what if there were those people who were expert at um, growing and building uh, a company? And if we could split those two out, maybe there would be a lot more startups. Maybe they would do a lot better. I certainly know there are a lot of founders who are not doing a particularly good job because they're currently sitting in a CEO role. And that's the piece that I'm, I'm really interested in exploring and trying to break. I think you're being a real mold breaker here in, in sort of a meta entrepreneur where you're disrupting the status quo. I've heard that the idea, of course, before about the founder, some founders not being great CEOs. But I think what I admire really about you and your take on this is that you are trying to be very constructive about this. And actually, even though you may not have fully fleshed it out, what a, an organization of that ilk might look like, that you are pointing the way towards a model that in hindsight seems very obvious, where yes, people have different strengths, and some are much better at the founding mid. So let's do something positive with it and have some sort of organization where there's a couple of people who just see opportunities where others only see problems or things that seem unsolvable. And then there's others who are really good at the nuts and bolts and the operations of a business. I really love that idea that you are taking something that was a problem initially and you're turning it into something positive. Thanks. I mean, it took me 17 years to realize this, even though um, retrospectively it feels very obvious. Mm. And then also, I don't want to claim that this is the, something that I've thought of. So, you know, Entrepreneur First, which is a incubator slash accelerator in London, brings together potential teams and then they forge businesses. And there's a great article uh, which I think is called The Alchemy of Business, or uh, at least it has alchemy in the title by one of the founders of Entrepreneur First. And they've done something which no one else did, which is take a group of people with no ideas, bring them together, and help forge those businesses from scratch. Um, and it's been very successful. There are other traditional accelerators that take businesses that are beginning to work and, and push them faster. And then there are incubators. And incubators, um, there are... Um, quite a few of them and quite often uh, they don't work that well and so that's another interesting area of exploration for me which is you know there are people who've, who've been in this space trying to create new entities why is it that they don't manage to do it 
very well. Um, I think there are some that have worked, and I, I would love to study them more closely. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not the, the forerunner here. But what I am, what I am trying to do is to just be more vocal and, and help other founders that were in the position that I was in, which is, um, you know, I, I, I talked earlier about mental health and a third of founders being um, in severe difficulties from a mental health perspective. During my period at Huli, I think I went through periods of depression that were caused by the business. And I've also made life choices that, um, that have resulted in me being singularly focused on that business to the detriment of lots of other parts of my life. And I think that that, that was a mistake. And I think that that was because I felt trapped in this narrative that I had to be there all day. And so uh, the only thing that I would like to come out of this uh, exploration of this topic is to help other people feel a bit less trapped or to challenge that existing belief that there is only one way to do it and you need to you need to be that founder that, that takes the business all the way and you have to sacrifice all sorts of other things in your life in order to get to that point. Exactly. And I think this is your contribution to this discussion where there are incubators I know very well of about Entrepreneur First and I've been part of a company that was essentially spun out of an incubator. The, the, I think what you bring to the table here is the bottom-up view in that that people are very different and that some are better at the founding bit and some are better at the running bit. And that when it comes to incubators, they tend to look at it from a top-down view, as in we are a group of people and we are um, helping founders to formulate their idea, to see how they can get to product market fit. I think uh, Forward Ventures started as that as well, right? Mm -hmm. Where you just simply yeah. take somebody who comes in with, with an idea and then they equip them with the CEO chops, so to speak, yeah. right? Speaking of CEO chops, you mentioned Larry Page before, and I think that's an exa interesting example there of something that we have not yet explored. Namely, Larry Page and Sergey Brin got to where they are today with a, you never know the control uh, test, of course, but um, Eric Schmidt was an important figure in the early growth stages of Google. So I think Eric Schmidt came in in 2002 or 2003, I believe, and then he left in 2011. I, I, I will look, look at the times, but he was the kind of adult supervision over yeah. the two guys. And you arguably... Larry Page learned to be the CEO while working with Eric Schmidt. So I think one of the paradigms that we have not explored yet is the idea of you learning to become a CEO. Yes, everything which there is no course for is difficult. I would just simply want to encourage people when they listen to this, not simply take their skills as given, but also look at the CEO topic as something that can be learned rather than just concluding, oh, I'm more of a founder and that's it. That's why this is such a knotty topic, because um, who knows where you get on and get off. Every, every person's different and every business is different. And that creates an infinite number of possibilities. And I think that there are examples out there, Larry Page, Mark Zuckerberg, and so on and so forth, who've managed to make the transition from being the founder into very good CEOs. So I think you make a very good point. Uh, I think they did, in Google's case, bring in um, adult supervision, as you put it, and, and then ended up being CEOs again of their businesses. Um, there's also a number of articles about um, the companies are more likely to succeed if the, the founders end up being good CEOs than if they bring someone in. So in a perfect world, you'd have a founder who's so dedicated about a singular topic uh, that they are willing to do anything over the course of a huge number of years to get to the point where they drive that business. And in the early stages, it will be founding. And in the later stages, it will be ceo or managing and that somebody can make that transition. But I think it's asking a lot of the person and it's a particular type of person and a particular type of opportunity that that person is the best person to do the whole process. So I would not for a second recommend people just quit because they feel more founders. But I do think that if there was more discussion, if there was greater awareness of skills, um, if people were much more open about how they feel and mental health, and if the narrative was... Um, a little bit less constrained, then I, for example, as Tom Savage, could be focused on spinning things out at a fair velocity 
and that uh, there could be a number of people who like running the one to five year bit who could take those on. And then there would be a number of people who could take the next section on. Or there would be somebody who's willing to go the whole route and really enjoys the challenge of going from an entrepreneur to a CEO. And, and that's um, totally laudable as well. So it's, it's just um, that there are so many different types of people. In my own case, it was, I think, maybe even the early schooling um, and my fetish for freedom that has resulted in me kind of not enjoying that CEO bit. But at the same time, I think I heard it said of Larry Page that he was your classic Montessori kid who was always doing exactly what he wanted to do, but he had an extraordinary vehicle in the form of Google which enabled him to be free within a, an organisation. Um, and I just don't know what would have happened if I had been in his seat and him in mine and so on and so forth. I think at the core of all of this is is tolerance within the market mm -hmm. for different ways of doing things. Exactly. We're, ent we're entrepreneurs for fuck's sake, so let's be entrepreneurial about being entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And that's that's a very good way of putting it. And that's what I thought when you mentioned that this is a, a paradigm that is not being discussed enough, as in we are too stuck in how an entrepreneur should be. You need to found something, you need to get investment, and then you need to slog at it until you succeed. And this is yeah. simply another paradigm, if I can use that word, to, to success. Exactly. And I think um, I, I, the, the uphill, downhill momentum piece I mentioned is that, that um, you know, I just think that, that too many people get stuck in that uphill pattern because of the story rather than iterating and changing things around them to get to a point where things start to work. Um, you know, the, the problem is this, this, this need for determination within a business to get it going. But that can often mask problems that just shouldn't exist because people are pushing through hard things which don't need to be pushed through. Mm. So it's, it's a delicate balance and it's a really interesting topic. You know, my point is let's be entrepreneurial about being entrepreneurs, but also uh, it's really important for the entrepreneurs themselves to seek help, to talk to other people around them. Uh, I've done therapy, I've done coaching, and I think both are extraordinarily powerful things. I've also got a, a really rewarding and amazing group of friends who are entrepreneurs, the group that you mentioned and a couple of others that I'm part of. And I think that that helps me explore the somewhat lonely journey of sitting out front of the business with other people who are doing the same things and therefore being able to share the trials and tribulations and so on and so forth. So if I, if I saw an entrepreneur who didn't have other entrepreneur friends, I would strongly encourage them to do that. I would strongly encourage them to seek as much help along the way as possible from professionals like therapists and coaches. And then I would also remind them that the big exit, which is often the, the, the pipe dream of an entrepreneur, is not the, the end goal that you think it's going to be. So focus on the journey and make sure that you're enjoying each day as much as, much as you can and doing things in a manner which you would be proud of even if the thing failed. And uh, yeah, and I think kind of um, a mixture or a combination of all of those things will, will create much healthier entrepreneurs that, that this kind of mental health problem, you know, is, is, is growing. And I think it's, it's, it's something that we can fight by, by putting less pressure on people for the all or nothing approach to entrepreneurship. That's, that's fine. But let me challenge you a little bit on this topic of enjoy each day. And that's actually one thing that I, when I read your post about this topic, you mentioned fight or flight when it comes to running just one business. And that reminded me a bit of many people who are eternally single, where they think, oh, just committing to one woman, one man, usually it's, it's men who have this problem, where they say just committing to one person is stifling to me and so on. And isn't this a little bit of a reflection of the culture that we live in, which says that everything should be nice and good and comfortable? Isn't discomfort, a certain level of discomfort at least, important for forging good character? Enjoying every day is, if you expect that, I think you're going to get disappointed a lot. Uh, I think that's an absolutely fantastic point. So, for example, uh, we started this podcast with meditation. One of the key things in meditation is to watch the, the pain, the suffering, the problems, the, 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 the bad stuff come and go and sit with it and recognize that life isn't about optimizing for happiness necessarily, but, um, but being able to tolerate and maybe attach 
less of oneself to the pain. There is a wonderful book called Man's Search for Meaning, which is given away uh, by therapists and so on by a man called Viktor Frankl, uh, who was a psychotherapist who I think he was housed in four different concentration camps over the war. And the book is about both his experience and then his learnings from it. And I think a lot of that is about recognizing that life has large component parts of suffering to it. And it's how we react to that that makes us who we are, not trying to avoid it that makes us who we are. And I think your point about the the perennially single, you know, that chimes a little bit with my own personal life. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I'd made sacrifices along the way to being an entrepreneur. And one of those has included probably not investing enough in, in relationships. And so it's it's an extraordinarily important point. You know, I wouldn't call myself a Buddhist, let's say, but um, one of the key tenets of Buddhism is that life has large elements of hardship to it. And you can't avoid that hardship so you're better placed to learn to be with that hardship and look at the sources of it and understand those and it's only through being with it and understanding them and looking at it that you actually start to get some alleviation from it Mm. Uh, so without meaning to go too deep i'm not for a second suggesting that people avoid the hard bits um, uh, and that meaning comes from dealing with those hard bits but Uh, At the same time, I would question whether or not putting people through severe mental stress to the point where a third of all founders have mental health issues is the right example of maximizing the benefit that comes from this entrepreneurial journey or if people are actually lost in that journey, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I mean, I feel when when I hear you talk, I do remember my own journey when I started my food company in 2012, which was called Dinner, and it was a food delivery business similar to HelloFresh, only without the subscription. It, it never worked out. We never took off. We never had proper product market fit, yet I was slogging at it with a minimum budget of, you know, almost not taking any salary, and it was a real, real struggle. And I think having that view that you are kind of teaching me about i think it would have helped me a lot in not not necessarily quitting earlier but in seeing that maybe i was i'm a better ceo than a founder right i probably think that on that spectrum it's i don't necessarily see opportunities everywhere i go so probably if you and i teamed up we would be a good team in that i think i'm better at running things rather than rather than founding them. And yeah. I probably think this is also a good topic to end on where what could be a structure of an organization that could bring this into reality? Would this be a group of like-minded people like yourself, and there's plenty of them as we know now based on the reaction to your post, who are great at starting things and then you are part of a network of people who are good at running things? And then you would be, it would be a constant flow of, of, uh, of ideas and of executions and of essentially l- lift-offs of different ideas. Because many people that I know that, would, that say at least that they would like to start something very often complain, but I don't have a good idea. So I think there is a complementarity waiting to happen between somebody like you and somebody who says they don't have an idea. So what would be a good model of an organization that could bring this into fruition? Um, I, I wish I had the answer to that question. That is my my challenge, my exploration of, of this year, and hopefully a few years yet. Um, I'm trying a few different models just personally, in that so far this year I've started three different companies, and they all have taken a slightly different shape and form. I think that Entrepreneur First, as I have mentioned earlier, is a, is a really interesting example. And I've not been into the offices and met the team, so I've just heard about them and I know people involved. But I would love to explore that more. So I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a clean, clear, crisp. Um, I made this discovery earlier this year and now I have the answers to your question. But back to your point, I kind of made the joke that a bit like the kid in the sixth sense, You know, whereas he sees dead people, I see businesses. Um, Wherever I look on a day-to-day basis, I I see things that I would like to change and I would like to solve, and I see problems in the world. Uh, My own focus, as I mentioned earlier, is 
companies which team up the profit and the doing good motive. So here in Bristol, for example, you know, I walk down my local street and there is significant evidence of a severe homeless and drug problem. There is also an immigration and refugee crisis that we're currently suffering. Um, I think there's an ageing crisis in how people are, are treated uh, in home. So one idea that I think has been televised recently, which is um, putting crashes into old age people's homes or even putting students alongside people who are suffering loneliness. So I, I just kind of look around and walk around and, and see all of these opportunities. I don't have enough time to start an old age people's home with a crash in it. I don't have enough time to start an Airbnb for uh, refugees. I don't have enough time at the moment to even go and work at the local drugs project. I wish I did. But what I'm saying there is that, that these problems that face us every day, the things that we see, there are solutions to those. And, I, and I'm just not phased by the process of somebody telling me that I can't do something or it doesn't work that way or it's not possible. I'm a bit of a red rag to a bull because normally when that has happened, I found a solution and it works well. So the thing that I'm most excited about is now that I'm freed up from the day-to-day -day management of a singular entity, I have the possibility to at least attack more of these problems. And it's also a bit selfish in that going and exploring something that I'm really interested in is something that I love doing. So as somebody who learns by doing, the early stages of research and creation around an, an idea, even if that idea never gets off the ground, is just fun. So rather than going to lectures and reading books, I'm just somebody who learns by going out and asking difficult questions and saying, what if we did it like this? And that's what I love. And I think there are lots of people like me who are good at that bit. And then there are other people who need a bit of structure, um, who are much better at taking a, a vision and working on that day to day. And so I, I don't have a structure that encapsulates all of that, but I do have a deep desire in myself to, to be somebody who goes out and forages for these early stage ideas and tries to do things that fit within a, a key mission. And then I want to try and do that enough time so that when we have a podcast in a couple of years' time, I can tell you that, that I've created an organization or a pattern that works really well and then we can hand it over to lots more people and it will scale. Mm. I think it's so important that not only do we question the ways how business is currently being done, which is a traditional role of entrepreneurs to disrupt, to innovate, but also to rethink the model of how we work. And I've spoken to a bunch of fantastic people this year already who you know, have great ideas about part-time work or about how they run the organization without hierarchies. And uh, I think you're on the forefront and really doing an incredibly great contribution to this whole discussion about how humans can flourish and how they can unfold their potential. So kudos to you and thank you for doing this great work of uh, changing the, the way we work. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, uh, I'm enjoying myself having been through a patch of time when I wasn't enjoying myself so much. So it's good to be in a position where I feel like I'm starting to, um, to push things downhill rather than uphill. Great. Any last messages, anything that you would like our audience to, to do, to explore? Where can they follow you and learn what you will be up to in the next couple of months and years? Oh, that's kind. Um, I, I write a blog uh, and it's called Simple Tom. Um, and that's, that's probably the best place to reach me. And I'm also on Twitter. My tag is at Bright Green, although I'm not there that often, but I will respond eventually. And the message I'd like to leave people with is, is one that's been kind of throughout this, this podcast, I hope, which is that entrepreneurship is a, is a growing field and that there are people learning more and more about how to do it. And there are a lot of struggles within it. And I think that for anybody that's thinking about it or wants to start a business or is running a business, It's really important to, to know yourself, to admit vulnerabilities, to seek help. And I would be very, very happy to either talk directly to people who are struggling with some of the things that I've talked about that I was struggling, 
or to pass people over to others who can help. Because one of the things that I've found in the last few years is when I've been more open, when I've been out and chatted to people, when I've made more entrepreneur friends and told them how I really feel, rather than just claiming that everything's going great, the more that I've actually uncovered people who share the same feelings and have taught me amazing things and, and felt like I've got a community. Uh, so that's been a, a wonderful blossoming of, of feeling like I've got a, a group of people that understand me rather than being lonely and isolated in, in this world. Excellent. Thanks so much, Tom, for taking the time. Really appreciate Pleasure. it. Thank you. Thank you for listening, guys and gals. If you like this and want to know when new episodes come out, subscribe to the Unsafe Spaces podcast on unsafespacespodcast.com. And I see you around when the time comes to again dig beneath the surface and challenge conventional wisdoms.